The thing with Mars is that we want to go there, right? And we'd really like preferably to find water there. Liquid water best, ice okay, liquid water best. But so far we've found ice at the poles, we've found a little bit of ice under the equator and we found a tiny bit of water vapour in the atmosphere but not much. But uh, just recently they've been looking at some, some data from 2018 from basically seismological data which is sound waves going through Mars yeah. that seems to indicate that about 10 to 20 kilometres below Mars's surface there may actually be liquid water which is very exciting. How on earth there's did they discover this? I mean, 10 to 20 kilometres under, and I understand it's trickling through as well. Right, so it's not definitely not drilling. It's yeah. not a big borehole. Um, and in fact, what the scientists have done is use models, so physics models, and they've said, oh, look, the models actually fit the data the best. And so what they've done with this, um, this mission uh, Basically, it looked for sound waves going through the crust and through the, the middle of Mars. So it's a bit like earthquakes on Earth. So I don't know if you know this, but um, have you ever been in a swimming pool and gone, wah, and made a really loud noise? Yes, um, of course. And you've obviously done that <laughs> in the air. Now, the sound actually travels at a different speed in the air than it does under the water, yes. which is one of the reasons, actually, that um, whales and dolphins can actually communicate long yes. distances with sound. And it's even more true with solids, right? Because the particles are really packed in close. Yeah. And so sound actually travels really fast through solid, uh, a little bit less fast through liquid and not as fast through gases. Right. And so by looking at the different speeds that um, quakes and also impacts on Mars' surface um, take to get through the different materials, we can sort of um, put models in and say, look, we think that that's solid, we think that that's liquid, yeah. um, and we can make guesses about what it is. And we actually do that for Earth as well. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. But at the end of the day, what do we learn from this discovery? How significant is it? Well, it's kind of interesting because, as I said, this is the first liquid water um, evidence we've got. Uh, it's not the sort of thing where we're going to go there and, and sustain ourselves as a, as a colony, you know, drilling 10 to 20 kilometres down. It's just not, not viable, at least not right now. Know, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, there, we've seen signs that there was on Mars's surface a lot of water. We've got oceans, we had really you no... Know, trickles, we've got streams and lakes and rivers and we've got sort of surface features that suggest that and also minerals that suggest that. But basically where's all the water? And the thing is that um, as Mars has cooled it sort of lost its atmosphere and the water's kind of boiled away. But also it seems that a lot of it has sort of um, gone into the bedrock which is actually like Earth. Earth has a lot of sort of aquifers and reservoirs as well. So um, it's fascinating because we want to know where life is, right? Yes. We, we want to know is there life on Mars and, and actually we, we think that liquid water is an important part of that yep. and so if we're finding liquid water down there maybe, who knows, that could be the best place to be looking for, for this life. Okay, a first step perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> we can all hope. Now let's turn our attention to uh, two astronauts who are stuck in space. What's happened there? So this happened a little while ago. They, they left on the 5th of June from Florida. They were supposed to do a, the first crewed test Starliner flight up to the ISS and come down sort of eight to ten days mission. Um, and actually the person has come out and said, uh, so the Boeing representatives actually come out now and said, oh, it was a mistake to say it was was going to be that quick because it was oh. really going to be as long as it as we needed to test it so it was a it was a crew test mission right, right. so um things do go wrong things are there's always hiccups and things like that so the starliner actually had some helium leaks before it left um they sort of fixed that and they went oh we think it's okay they launched it it got to the iss it went to dock and it had a whole bunch of helium propellant a uh, helium um so helium's in the lines to actually push the fuel to the thrusters and they had a whole bunch of helium leaks and also some of the thrusters failed when it went to dock right and they've been trying to fix these problems because basically they don't really want to put these two people back in starliner uh and face it towards earth because it needs these thrusters is to be reliable yep. in order to get the right angle and to come in safely. So at the moment, they just don't... There's, well, it, to quote Steve Stitch, he said, we didn't poll in a way that led to a conclusion right. when they took a vote as to whether they thought that the Starliner should bring the astronauts home at this time. It's, it's very good corporate speak for... Um, we don't all agree that it's safe right now and we're not okay. bringing them home until we do. Okay. So. Do they have any idea of when they can? Like, will this be months and... I understand it's not too bad up there for them. They, they, they do have enough supplies to sustain this. Long Absolutely, stay. yeah. So it's 
they do grow a little bit of food themselves, but most of the time food, supplies, repairs, because things go wrong, you know, they have to fix things, they all get sort of dropped off by a, a bunch of different automated robots, so they, uh, automated spacecraft. They go up there, they dock, they, they unload and they come back. Um, so that's, that's not really an issue. And, and most of the time, in fact, the minimum time to stay on the ISS is actually six months. So it's a tiny amount of time to be, quote, unquote, not stranded, um, according to NASA. They're more stuck. It's more like uh, your daughter has taken your car and you're stuck at home and you have to call a cab, right? It's a bit expensive, it'll take a bit longer because you don't have the vehicle that you expected to have. Um, and essentially, this whole six month thing means that they can't just get into the Crew Dragon that's there. Yep. Um, and the chances are the Starliner might actually be undocked uh, automatically and sent home on its own without the crew. Okay. Uh, and the issue with that is that um, the two astronauts that are up there basically are not going to get off the ISS until not only the next crew comes and replenishes, yeah. but they'll go home with that ship because okay. you've always got to have a lifeboat attached. And so if they go home, um, you know, in the one that it comes, so when Crew 9 arrives, they can't just get in that and take it home because then there's no lifeboat on the ISS in case something happens. So right. probably looking at maybe if they can't get Starliner going and if there's no other mission sent, um, February? Next February, year? okay. But it's a beautiful view. I wouldn't <laughs> I can complain. Imagine. I, I'm not sure they're complaining. Presumably they'd be having extra work to do and I hope they're getting paid overtime as well. Oh, you'd hope so. I know that during the Olympics they were doing sort of a space Olympics, but also what's quite interesting is um, they've been doing some plumbing, so this is kind of a bit of a gross okay. story, but <laughs> essentially uh, you sort of want to recycle everything and yeah. water included, so sweat, urine. Uh, and normally what they do is they the urine goes into a system and they recycle the water, so they extract the water out but that sort of failed and so they've, they've got basically got bags of urine being stored right. um, in, this, in the space system and now they've actually dropped off some plumbing and so one of the jobs um, that they've been helping with is repairing the plumbing and okay. getting that reclamation uh, system working again. Okay, fun times. Yep. I'm sure they're enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, um, tell us a bit more about what else we can expect in terms of space exploration and missions in, in the coming months. Yeah, this year's a hot one actually. Mm. Um, we've got Europa Clipper. Uh, the launch window for that opens in October, so sort of mid-October. And Europa Clipper is going to go to one of Jupiter's moons called Europa. While well, we're talking about water, yes. um, Europa basically has a, an icy surface and they, they believe that potentially is a, well, ocean world underneath and so what Europa Clipper is going to do is it's going to basically go past about 50 times past Europa and, and look for signs of this which is really really cool. Yeah. We've also got Artemis 2 coming yes. at the end of this year so that's that's basically um, test flying the Orion um, and the SLS um, from NASA which is basically a spacecraft and that's going to go out around the moon and come back yep. and that's paving the way basically for the first woman on the moon uh, next year hopefully in September 2026 uh, that's 2026 sorry 2026 yeah yes so we've got another year to go but okay. I'm so excited 25 20 uh, so we've got 2024 for Artemis Two, yes. yeah, and then 2025 or six. You know what? It'll be pushed back. It yeah. always <laughs> is. Um, and actually, the Crew Nine going to the ISS has been pushed back a month. So yeah. it actually doesn't okay. matter what I say. We don't want to put it's a date. It's always on it. going to be pushed back. But it's going to happen. Cross fingers, definitely. Claire, thanks so much for coming in. Thank you so much, Yvonne.